Shalom and welcome to our viewers and once again to my friend, Yonathan Jonathan Pollard. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. As always, before we begin our discussions, I ask you, here I'm revealing no great trade secret, I ask you what, what's on your mind and what would you like to, <laughs> what points would you like to cover? And uh, the first on, on our agenda today is uh, recent threats made by Egypt, at, uh, directed at Israel, connected to the uh, so-called Philadelphia Corridor. And uh, I think many people would like to know or need to know what exactly is this Philadelphia Corridor. A lot of people don't actually know what it is and why is it so crucial to, to Israel's security. And how has this that area of the Egyptian Gaza border been uh, been weaponized against us? From the start, the Philadelphia corridor was a security zone, Israeli security zone that ran from the Mediterranean inland about thirteen kilometers. When that zone was evacuated, when we pulled out of uh, Aza, um, it became a, 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 a location of tunnels uh, leading back and forth between uh, a Hamas controlled Egypt and uh, a Hamas controlled Gaza and Egypt proper. Uh, Rafa in Egypt and Rafa, there's a Rafa Egypt and there's a Rafa Gaza. And of course, El Arish is very close. Uh, the Egyptian city El Arish is very close as well. And just just one, one just one moment. When were these tunnels dug? Since what year have they this, existed? They've been existed ever since we pulled out of um, Gaza and allowed Hamas to take over. Uh, In other the words, two thousand and five, according roughly. to the Gregorian calendar. Right, roughly around 20, 2005, yeah. And the minute we pulled out, uh, Hamas started digging tunnels like crazy. The Egyptians, of course, had a border, but uh, they're notoriously uh, corrupt and uh, got paid off, looked the other way, didn't care. And um, all this... Just, just, just didn't care or were actually... No, that's uh, one active, of the, actively uh, collaborating. That's another point I was just going to get to. The, these were the the issue, the justifications, the explanations to why so much equipment has been found in uh, heavy equipment, especially has been found in Gaza, and how it was that uh, Hamas Nikim uh, were able to leave, get trained in Iran, and come back. Back and it was a back and forth thing. Well, there were two things that kind of put a crimp in these in in Hamas's tunnel system, and that was when the um, Muslim Brotherhood uh, was overthrown by uh, General Sisi, when Morsi's uh, government was basically uh, over overthrown, and he was, of course, Muslim Brotherhood, and there's no difference between them and and Hamas. So there was an insurgency that was being uh, that was coming up at the time in Sinai. It still exists. That was anti-Egyptian, anti-Israeli. It's uh, allied to the Muslim Brotherhood, allied uh, to ISIS. Um, the Egyptians are barely containing it right now. But as far as the Philadelphia quarter was concerned, the Egyptians finally realized that there was a a synergy between Hamas and this insurgency in Sinai. So what did they do? Well, they tried to flood the tunnels with, um, if you'll excuse me, raw sewage. Now, God forbid, if we should ever try anything like that, I don't even want to think about what the re international reaction would be, but they, they flooded it. And um, were they successful? Were they not? Well, I think if you look at what's in Gaza right now, the arsenal that Hamas has, you would be forgiven for thinking they didn't do a very good job of it. So, in, this, what, this, in, what, in what year did this take place? They began digging, you say, around 2005, 2006. 
Right, and we're we're looking and at when when did Assisi come to power? That was around well, 2000, we're looking really eleven, about eleven, about twenty eleven, about that. And when did about they try that. to flood these tunnels? About the same time, because th this is where they realized that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was going back and forth as well as Hamas into Gaza, and coming back with. Into the, into the Sinai and into from Gaza. And into the Sinai, Sinai and, and, and fueling the insurgency there and also providing weapons to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt itself. So this is Morsi's guys. So they flooded the tunnels imperfectly. Okay, well, since then, up to the present day, um, as I said, they've either looked the other way because they don't care they've been paid off or there's a reason for them looking the other way. And it's something that I've taught, I talk about quite a bit, which is Egypt's incentive, critical incentive of having a dagger uh, pointed at one of our Negev flanks. And it, it would be in this case, our Western flank that in the event of a, of an Egyptian uh, Israeli war, they would want us diverted. They would want our, our strategic uh, interests split between the Sinai, where they're pouring in, and Gaza. There was a big rocket arsenal. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting a taste of that now, or have gotten a taste of it. Um, and cross-border threats as well, which October 7th was. Um, so they, they're kind of indifferent, really, to whatever is going on in... Uh, uh, Gaza, as long as they don't, the Hamas doesn't come and fuel the insurgency in, in Egypt uh, um, or in the Sinai. Well, now we're talking about uh, coming actually back. More than, more than indifferent, they actually have a vested interest, as you well, said. Well, when, when I say indifferent, there's a, a pattern in Egypt of gross negligence. I mean, it's really incredible. Within the army itself. Um, bordering on criminal negligence. So we, we have we always have to at least mention that. But above all else, the Egyptians know full well, even with all the bakshish and the corruption, they know what's going on, at least that. And to the extent that they knew what was going on and did nothing about it, then there was a reason for that. And that reason was they wanted Hamas to represent this kind of threat to Israel. Hamas doesn't represent a threat to them. It really doesn't. They can cut it off like that. But it, they understand, the Egyptians understand that Hamas does very, you know, represent a real threat to Israel. And we've just had an example of that on October 7th. An event, by the way, that is supported by the overwhelming number of Egyptian citizens. I just saw a, a picture, in fact, a video of a recent uh, soccer match in, uh, I think it was Cai it was either Cairo or Alexandria, in Cairo, I think, over 100,000 people screaming in unison, you know, with our blood and our soul will liberate Palestine. Yes, there, sure. there, was, there was no that. ambiguity. Right. Yeah, there was no ambiguity about where their sentiments um, are, are focused right now. So, so much for it being a, a fringe element. So much for being a fringe element. You don't you don't so, find fringe elements inside football stadiums. Um, if there is a fringe element, it's very short lived. Very short. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So what's happened lately? Well, we under Israel understands that unless we reoccupy the Philadelphia corridor and dig a real barrier. I'm sorry, you have to explain what exactly is this corridor. Well, it's. Um. A it's, piece a of land. it's a piece of land from the Mediterranean inland on Gaza's western border uh, to the west of Rafah, Rafiah, in about 13 kilometers. And we used to have security patrols there that would always come under fire from both, both Egypt, the Egyptian side, as well as the Gaza side. It was a real hot uh, deployment area, I'll put it that way. This so is now the, the, the Egypt that signed a peace treaty with us. Yeah. I mean, the patrols were getting slammed by uh, terrorists based in, in Egypt. 
that the Egyptians basically didn't do anything about. It. They just watched as they fired our, you know, RPGs and heavy machine guns. And their compatriots in Gaza did the same thing from the other side. It was like a shooting gallery almost. So now we're going back and we're going to establish a real barrier to prevent any more infiltration of men and equipment uh, into Gaza. Well, the Egyptians have gone, come up on their high horses. What are they doing? They're doing two things. Number one, they are significantly reinforcing their own border um, on the west side of the Philadelphia corridor, on the Sinai side, in order to prevent any of the Gazans from leaving. They're building the western wall of a prison, basically. Why? Well, look, they understand how indoctrinated and propagandized these people are. And they're not, fr they're not friends of the CC government. The CC government could very easily just send them on their way, but they don't need they they don't want any part of it. They'd rather sick them on us. They're considered a contagious disease, do a lethal. Mean, do, do you mean to say that the uh, Arab brethren do not actually like them? I'm I'm shocked. They hate them. Really? I mean, look how they're treated. Who, who would who would have guessed? Uh, look how they're treated in Lebanon. Uh, basically, you know, you want to talk about apartheid. They can't get jobs. You know, they can't get education. They basically can't leave their squalid refugee camp. And and this is the attitude of all. Pretty Jordan, much of, Jordan, of, Jordan is not very different. Jordan is not very different. I mean, they Syria. had a black Syria is not very different. 70, you Syria know, where they the killed, same. I don't know, 10, 15, 20,000 of them after they tried, after Arafat tried to stage a coup. Uh, a revolt against uh, King Hussein. The famous black they didn't have any problem at all sending in the Arab Legion and slaughtering men, women, and children. They didn't have any problem. You had armed Fatah guerrillas crossing the Jordan and surrendering to Israeli troops rather than being butchered by the Arab Legion. I mean, it was it was incredible to see these pictures. So now Egypt is saying, you can't, under the terms of the Sinai Agreement, you can't bring all the soldiers that you want in to develop this corridor. Now, you have to understand the chutzpah involved with this. We have agreed to every breach of the Camp David Accords the, that covered the Sinai so that Egypt could bring in as many troops and uh, armor, artillery, whatever they wanted, as needed to contain the uh, ISIS type insurgency in Sinai. We, we said, okay, we understand your problem, bring your soldiers in, even though it violated the agreement. Okay, when we want to do the same thing on a much more temporary basis, by the way, to build and initially uh, safeguard this new corridor barrier, the Egyptians are saying, no, you can't do it. Look at the agreement. Under the agreement, you can't do this. We're forbidding you from doing that. This is called chutzpah. I mean, we could turn around and beat them over the head with the same agreement saying, okay, you got that. Get all your soldiers out of, the, out of Sinai. Every single one of them, get them out. And this would just go back and forth. And so instead of asking the Egyptians for permission to build this barrier and to man it for a certain length of time, we should just do it. And if the Egyptians want to squawk, they can squawk all they want. Now the problem, the ultimate problem here is not the barrier. The ultimate problem is this mass of indoctrinated, brainwashed, pro-Hamas Gazans. So, before this war erupted, before October 7th, the last poll that was taken indicated that about 65% of the Gazans just wanted to get out, leave, go anywhere. These are not Hamas Nikim. These are just people that have had it. And, like, and like, the, like the famous hitchhiker holding up a sign where you're supposed to indicate where you want to go, saying anywhere but here. Precisely. Precisely. That's a very good one. I'll have to remember that one. Thank you. Correct. 
but the rest of them um, are problems. And no Arab state wants them. None. Uh, Turkey doesn't even want them. Uh, Iran doesn't want them. Qatar doesn't want them. Kuwait doesn't want, certainly doesn't want them. People tend to forget that right after the Gulf War, Kuwait expelled over 850,000 Palestinians because of their collaboration with the Iraqi occupation regime. They just chucked them out straight into the Iraqi desert, said, get out. And, you know, and now they're championing the uh, the Palestinian cause, which, again, is another example of chutzpah. So this is the problem right now with with Egypt. The country itself wants war with us. The elite right now, and we're talking about the military elite, is doing everything it can because it's making a lot of money right now. Um wants to keep the kind of the lid on it while at the same time forcing us to deal with a an armed lethal Gaza for various strategic reasons. So what are we to do? Well, one suggestion is not to pay any attention to the Egyptians at all. Reoccupy the corridor, dig the barrier, man it, for, with his, for as long as you want. And if the Egyptians really want to um, up the ante, this is where we have a very quiet discussion with Sisi. It's a very quiet discussion. And just say, look, within 20 minutes, you're going to lose Cairo, Alexandria, Port Said, Suez, the Aswan Dam, about 10 targets within 20 minutes. We don't really want to do this. But if you keep this up and you keep pouring troops above and beyond what's justified by your ins counterinsurgency needs into the Sinai, you're going to put us in a position where we're going to have to strike first. We will not allow the Sinai to become an armed camp. Again, we, we have too many strategic problems right now. So if that's the way you want to go, tell us now and uh, we'll get it over with. That This is the way you're supposed to talk to people quietly, not, not on the front page of newspapers or on uh, on TV or the Internet. Very quietly tell them what time it is. To, uh, to one's enemies, yes, definitely. To one's enemies. You know, um, as I always like to say, and people are asking me to quit reminding them, but in Texas, uh, where I grew up, um, the best way of convincing somebody that you're mean business is to simply show them your gun. With your back turned to everybody else, just show them your gun and just say, I know how to use this and I'm prepared to. You really want to push me to this? It's fine. I'll accommodate you. That's Texas. And unfortunately, this or, or fortunately, this is something that bully boys tend to understand. And one reason why, and this may lead to our next issue of what's the tragedy that just happened in, in Gaza to our, our army. This is why I wanted to make sure that whenever anybody in the Arab world thought of Gaza, all they would think in their head was rubble from one end to the other. And that rubble was produced by a Jewish army. We all remember with Hafaz al-Assad in Syria, what's called Hama rules. Hama was a city that, was, that went into revolt against uh, uh, the current uh, Assad's, uh, Bashir Assad's uh, father, yes. who was a, a brute of a man. And what he did was he said, okay, the city's revolt. He ringed the city with artillery, tanks, bombed it from the air for about a week, two weeks. They killed and he killed an estimate, an estimated 30,000 people. It was probably far more than that. And the city was and reduced to rubble. To rubble. And it was, this was called Hama rules, which was uh, a metaphor for the, for the Arab approach to dealing with problems. So we need a Jewish equivalent of that. And that may be 
Gaza rules, where when people even get the thought of hurting us, they'll stop because the first thing that will come into their mind is the rubble of Gaza. 